Um, I guess one of the things that immediately comes to mind to me is that there's been so much attention towards particular outcomes associated with literacy. And this has been a real challenge. It's been a real bugaboo. Um, on the one hand, it's really good for our field because it talks about accountability. And all of you talked about specific outcomes. But at what point do we need to think about, and how did you think about refashioning your programs away from what was just the old pure literacy? You know, I remember when it was OK to just say, you know, we're teaching literacy, and everybody got it. It just made sense, and it was just a really good thing. Now, it's really what you do with that literacy that's really critical. You're either out there to get a job, to get a better job, or to keep your job. Um, you want to be able to try to read your kids and have them have a better education. You explicitly uh, want to look to try to get or being pushed into post-secondary involvement. These are really critical themes. And in fact, that's what people are funding these days. And in some cases, uh, we as a good example of this, they're going to be even more targeted to specific kinds of outcomes that aren't exactly literacy outcomes, but they're going to be individual outcomes. How do you deal with that and wrestle with that in terms of your programs? Um, and maybe I'd like everyone to respond, but Karen, you know, you went at it head on because you went right into these Asian disease and said, hey, I can help you with it. How, what was it that, how, how did you refashion your thinking of a program along those lines? Well, we, we did, it started actually almost about the time I came out, comes became the big buzzword and everybody had to have them. So I almost started from day one having to have outcomes. Um, so what we started with was because we were doing costless testing anyway, one of our outcomes could be you know, making gains in CASAS, so that was easy to do. Um, but then the State Library came up with a um, way for us to track people setting goals and meeting goals, which I think for our literacy learners is much more important than, you know, a learning gain on a CASAS test, because unfortunately CASAS doesn't measure everything our learners learn. Right, Julia? <laughs> so, um, so we always say, um, when I do outcomes, I'll say, you know, 80% of our learners are going to make a gain after 50 hours of instruction. I always throw that one in there. And then I'll say, or meet a personal goal. And they like, they're fine with that, you know. So if somebody can't make that learning gain, they're still meeting their goal. And they're still making progress. So, so we use that kind of thing to show that we're um, having an outcome. And in California, um, particularly the library system, developed the roles and goals process, right, which was really very forward thinking. In fact, at Pro Literacy, we've used that and forwarded that on as an example uh, for congressional staff on what things you can do without necessarily having to have um, some of the solid infrastructure associated with explicit educational gain. Now, Betty, you took that same kind of approach, but you took a little different approach to it because you said, you know something, um, the kind of cost associated with having to put in place the kind of testing requirements of the state is really too burdensome, and it's not relating specifically to the kind of outcomes our students were doing. So how did you come to that, that, that conclusion, and what kind of process did you use? The other reason that drove that decision was to do it the state's way and still have volunteer tutors it just wasn't working, and we didn't want to hire teachers, which is part of the cost. We wanted to stay true to the literacy volunteer model of having volunteers do the teaching. So when we made the decision, we just walked away from the standardized testing, just tore those little puppies up and said, we're done. But what we did do is look at those, uh, the national outcomes, sort of the life skill outcomes, uh, and looked at how could we use those. So, th so that's all we do now. You know, we just talk to funders about what we measure are the real life changes that a learner experiences because of tutoring. So, you know, they now read to their children, or they got a job, or they got a promotion, or, you know, I, I just talk to funders about whatever it was that brought the person in the door. Then that's what we're going to measure. Are they coming in because they want to help their kids with their homework? Well, then we're going to measure. Can they do that now? And how you know do they do they do it occasionally, frequently? You know how do they? So we just modified our whole database to be able to track. You know what is it that that person is now doing that they didn't do before they started tutoring? And it's hard to come up with percentages that we still struggle with that, you know. So we can say 80% of the learners who who retain, you know, who stuck with us through the year 
achieved at least one of the goals that they came in with. When we try to break it into those goals, then it's like, well, how many setbacks? And, and then we count life skill outcomes. Maybe it wasn't their goal when they came in the door to get a job. They might have been too afraid to say they wanted to get a job. But in 18 months, they did get a job. Well, you know, hallelujah, we're going to count that even though they didn't, <laughs> they didn't say it was a goal from the get-go. Yes, yes. So we're measuring all the achievements, and it's th we've struggled with how to simplify the process so that our volunteer tutors can report that back to us. And I, I, it's taken us, I bet, three, maybe four years to get that working as smoothly as it is. It's still not totally smooth. I hope by next year we have a real easy online way that volunteers can just put that right in and, and it'll automatically go into our database, but we're still working on that. Just a quick observation, you know, I think that, um, you know, one of that's one of the real key things to think about is in terms of the roles of volunteers. You know, I have often said, you will never solve the adult literacy problem in the United States with volunteers, but you will never solve it without volunteers. And I think that that is a concept that has really been lost, and one I think that we really need to think about that, that you need a diversity of services and programs. Um, I think the other thing that that's really interesting is that you were able to attract serious funding, private sector funding, with that kind of conceptual model. I think that's a real important point, is that you can articulate specific kinds of things that we're going to be able to track and we're going to be able to measure. But these are complex individuals, as we all are. And they have a wide range of other goals and activities going on. You need to factor that in, and you clearly did that, I think, in a really good way. It was a conscious decision not to become another Pima Community College adult education program. We already have one of those. The community-based adult education program serves a whole different niche of students, and we just decided to stay committed to that. Can't add too much more, but I, I think just to uh, I think <coughs> Betty's right on target. One of the, one of the uh, missions I, I was always a vocal one about not letting the funding uh, drive the mission or letting the tail wag the dog. Part of our mission is to educate the funders and say, you know, thanks for your money and thanks for thanks for sharing your ideas on what literacy is. But let me tell you what they really are um, in a nice and diplomatic way. Um, so. So many of the things I see to measure outcomes, and I'm, I'm, I'm working for a nonprofit mental health agency now, and they're also struggling with that because it's a similar, any helping agency, you know, you're not making widgets. You know, you're, you're changed product as a human being. Um, and how do you measure that? Um, and so I don't think we ought to stray too far, as, as Jose Cruz says, you know, let's not stray too far from the anecdotes. Um, that's sort of at the heart of what we do. If we have to make them into outcomes, and outcomes, listen, nobody's going to complain if people's quality of life can be measured and, and, and uh, you know, numbered and substantiated. That's great. That helps the field. Um, I'll, just, I'll just add to this, and this is just a philosophical question that I, that I sort of bring out. Um, I think maybe we've got the wrong idea about what literacy, how to present literacy. You know, nobody gets on Weight Watchers for people dropping out and not succeeding the first time around or for having... Uh, inconsistent membership, or uh, what do we call it? Uh, failure to persist um, by coming. Nobody, nobody gets on AA, you know, for not having those numbers of hey, you know, you didn't have 80% people recover the first time they went through rehab. You know, it's like 7%, and then they come back the second time or the fifth time, or maybe maybe they get it the eighth time, and that's really the model that I've always felt literacy was more like. You've got, especially with adults, you've got adults out there working raising kids, it's a hard, hard thing, and it takes a tremendous amount of courage. And to try to, and try to put that, um, that square peg in the round hole doesn't always work. And so I think it's part of our job is to sort of educate funders that, yeah, yeah, in theory, you know, uh, you know, the question that used to bug me all the time was, okay, we're gonna put this person in your program, a brother, a sister, a student, uh, somebody in the social service system, how long before they, you know, they're reading at about a fifth grade level, how long before they can read at a 10th grade level? It's like if somebody else asks me that, I'm going to slit my wrists. You know, it's how, how often are they going to be, how often are they going to come? What's the tutoring going to be like? Are we going to hit their learning style? There's so many variables, as Peter said, we're complex human beings. And, and maybe the literacy field needs to just have a little more of a dialogue about that, you know, that we're, you know, we're not a factory. 
And I, and I think everybody knows that, but I judge, I, you know, anyway, that's my rant. <laughs> Thanks. If I could just add on to that, I, I mentioned that we do the monthly, actually we do them twice a month now, the literacy briefings. That's one of the things that we're educating folks on all the time, not just funders, but anybody who comes in and that will listen is to say, look, you know, life happens. To be a successful adult education program is not about, you know, retention first time around. It's do you have an open door? Can they come back? That's what's really important. And, and when you tell some stories about all the different things that people are dealing with, as well as trying to come to class, you know, then people are amazed at like, oh my gosh, how do they do that? It's a great point, Rod, and I think that you know it's fascinating to me how we sometimes really ignore the research to this very point, and that is one of the pro literacy board members, Steve Reeder, who's a prominent researcher and does work on the longitudinal study of adult learners. And what he finds, plain and simple, that learners come in and out of programs over a lifetime in a variety of different circumstances and a variety of different ways, and we all know that but yet we still have this tendency to try to build a one-size-fits-all um, factory. And we are an endeavor, and perhaps we need to spend more time thinking about what that's all about um, and what we are really all about. But I think that's a really good point um, and certainly a terrific example. John Corcoran, I know you can comment on it. I was um, 48 years old. I went to a public library in Carlsbad, California. A 65-year-old volunteer broke the code for me, uh, got me uh, on my journey to literacy. And uh, I went, to, uh, after uh, about 13 months with her, I went to a reading clinic and had a battery uh, diagnostic test there. And I was fortunate enough to have Pat Lindemood as my teacher. And if I had a magic wand, I'd wish every struggling reader to have a, a master teacher like her. And, and I, as I share my story, uh, sometimes one side of this discussion wants me to discount my volunteer tutor. And uh, I really appreciate what you said, Peter, is that we, we're not going to break this cycle of illiteracy in this country without volunteers and professionals. We can't, volunteers, to me, they're the symbol, the extraordinary, it was a 65-year-old volunteer tutor with 20 hours of training who loved reading. She was the one that got me to the clinic where I needed to go, uh, and it's a long journey. And and when people try to argue that with me or try to discount that volunteer, I say that was the ambulance driver that got me to the clinic, and that's what we that's what we're about, you know. And I never, in my wildest dreams, knew what my journey was going to be. And it's I think it's the same for for every adult uh, reader. And I thank you very much. You, were, you guys were fantastic. And we'll be back tomorrow, but we've, we've got to run off to another meeting. <laughs>